Hi folks, it's Andy and welcome to today's Kendo rant. Uh, let's get right into the questions. Um, okay, first one. You say that the Shimpan should raise their flag when there is Yuko Datotsu. Uh, that puzzled me a bit since I saw the video Ippon and Yuko Datotsu with Inoue Sensei. Uh, it's quite easy to find on YouTube. Um, and uh, In Inoue Sensei distinguishes Ippon and Yuko Datotsu. Uh, as I understand, Ippon is a point, Yuko Datotsu just a valid strike. Uh, in that case, a shimpan should raise the flag when there is an ippon, which uh, you call datotsu is an element of, or are those expressions you call datotsu and ippon use the same meaning most of the time? Okay, <clears throat> so this question is actually not from yesterday's video. It's, it, I should have answered it in yesterday's video actually, but for some reason it was like flagged as a spam comment. I don't know why, but I've gone in and I've unflagged it. So sorry about that, uh, that I'm a bit late getting to this question. Uh, but it is a great question. I went and watched the video. Um, I'd seen it before, but I went and refreshed myself on the video of uh, Inoue Sensei uh, talking about uh, the difference between Ippon and Yuko Datotsu. Um, and yeah, I guess your question is, is that um, according to his sort of teachings in that video, um, surely the Shimpans shouldn't raise the flags when they see the Yuko Datotsu, they should raise the flags when they see an Ippon. Um, but basically, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, okay, the way that Inoue Sensei in that video uses the word Ippon uh, is different. Uh, in terms of context to how um, the word Ippon is used in a kendo shiai and an, a, an actual formal shiai. Um, what he's talking about in that, the context of Ippon in that case is like, um, like the kind of 100% perfect technique um, in, in that that is... It, it, he, he's attaching the label Ippon to it, um, which is understandable. Um, and that Yuko Datotsu is what we have to award points um, so that, because obviously it's um, almost impossible to achieve a 100% perfect cut. And if we only judge those as uh, Yuko Datotsu, which is a valid point, valid strike, um, then uh, the Shi'ai would go on forever and ever and we'd never end up with anything so I had to lower the uh, the standard to maybe 80% perfect cut let's say and that could be counted as yuko even if it's not perfect uh, and his word that he's describing for the perfect cut would be a, a true eat bomb um, and that's uh, that it's kind of a different sense of the word eat bomb um, because what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the um, the regulations of a shi'ai and how it's conducted um, in that case, Ippon literally only means the t like one point, okay? So it's a way of describing the number of points awarded. Um, so, um, Yuko Datotsu and Ippon are used in a different context to how they are used in that conversation with Inoue Sensei uh, in that video, um, slightly. Uh, because... Um, a point that's, let's say, a strike that's 100% perfect, that can still qualify as you, that's obviously also you called that or two because it's above the kind of, let's say, 80% threshold. I'm, I'm saying 80% because that's what Inori Sensei actually said in the video, is it say 80% as an example. Um, but essentially, um, it, it's just used in a different context. So how I'd like to clear it up is um, the referee, the Shimpan, raise their flag when there is a you called that or two. That is correct. Okay, because they are signalling that there is a valid point uh, that's been uh, made, and then they award ippon. Okay, one point. Okay, because that's how a kendo shiai is um, is kind of uh, administrated. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, I think uh, Inoue Sensei sort of alludes to that that kind of the idea of sambon shobu fighting for three uh, the best of three points. Um, and he doesn't even call it Sambon Shobu, he, he calls it three Ippon. Um, so that's, that's he, he's got a bit of a different usage of the term in that respect. Um, yeah, he, he sort of alludes to, he doesn't necessarily come out and say specifically, but he kind of alludes to that he, that, that, that kind of takes away an element of, of uh, the true 
uh, acquisition of Ippon um, because all matches should be Ippon Shobu. Um, all encounters should be Ippon Shobu because if it was a fight with real swords, which Kendo is not about, but there is a, con a an element of the concept of fighting with real swords uh, involved in Kendo very heavily, and that's that's one of the parts of it, um, is of course that would only be Ippon Shobu. Um, and much how judo is, um, you know, uh, the, the kind of the the the, the, the kind of perfect waza in judo is called ippon, um, and they have lots lots of smaller denominations uh, within that. But it, it's not quite the same in kendo. And what when I'm saying ippon uh, with regards to the role of the shimpan, uh, they award ippon um, in terms of the, they award one point okay because the word ippon actually has very several it had very many not very many but it has it has several uh connotations and usages depending on the context all right there's not only one uh context for that specific word uh which is why obviously confusions arisen after you've watched that video um how oh, that makes sense <laughs> it's a bit difficult uh okay next one uh, if I wrote something like a scribble of an idiom or a phrase on my shinai, can it be used in a tournament or is it inappropriate? Um, <coughs> depends what it is. <laughs> uh, generally, uh, no, it's not a problem. Uh, generally, it's it, it's perfectly fine. Most people write the name. Um, some people like write kind of stuff on them to uh, inspire them a little bit. Don't see that very often so much, but it's perfect. You're perfectly well welcome to do so. Just as long as you don't write something that's like offensive or something, um, or like you know something that's going to upset somebody, um, then yeah, I c obviously th there's nothing li literally written in the rules against that sort of stuff. But I'm pretty sure that tournament organisers have a problem if you did. Um, so yeah, other other than that, by all means. Um, next one. Uh, this is a good question, actually. Uh, hello, Andy. My question is related to Kote. I recently bought a Kendo Star pair of Kote. Uh, the size is a little tight. Um, uh, I think you bought them on Outlet, didn't you? Um, uh, so I, I decided to enlarge the palm a little bit for uh, um, better fitting. Okay, so you bought, yeah, reading this, um, you bought them on an outlet, so they were a sort of decided size uh, that was written on the website when you ordered them, which were a little bit smaller uh, than your actual hands um, sizes. Uh, but you managed to stretch out the palms a little bit, and now they're great. Uh, and since I started using it, I definitely sense a huge difference over my old uh, kote uh, because the feeling of tight kote provided me the sense of increased control and the fact. Uh, of being very much flexible, moulded perfectly with my hands. Uh, but going back to my older kote, um, much larger, less flexible, uh, I realised the movements I w was able are not that easy with those. Uh, so it blew my mind thinking the time it took me to see how the gear plays a fundamental part and how you improve and develop. In Kendall, I can see that my uh, opinion, uh, my options have now grown significantly while doing Jigeko. Um, Going straight to the question, uh, which is better, tighter kote with more or more comfortable ones? Comfortable means a little bigger so that your hand has room to breathe and move freely rather than all leather-like glove. Very tight to your hands, thanks. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, that's a great question because I think a lot of people um, probably wonder about this. Um, I know that there's even places out there that like, kind of, I know, I know some people like to have kind of bigger kote or something like that. But um, my advice is always go with a slightly tighter fit. Um, if you if you're between the two, um, obviously the best is to have them to, to fit your measurements as close as possible. Um, it's best not to have too much room in the kote uh, because they tend to stretch with use. Um, now, obviously everyone's hands are different, um, and obviously it depends. Um, but let me give you an example. Okay, this is a this is a victory kote. Um, this is a brand new one straight out of the bag. Um, straight out of the bag here. Still got all the the stuff on it. This is this is my size. Um, and this, this kind of uh, fits nice and snug. Um, there's no kind of um, space in here. It's a little bit tight across the fingers, if I'm honest. Um, but I can, I, I mean, these Victory Cold Air are super flexible anyway. So like, they're like this right out of the packet. Um, uh, but that, that's because of how they're made. Most of our Cold Air are like that, actually. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit tighter than, it, I, it feels tight to me, and if I was to go and use this right away, um, I'd be perfectly fine to do so, I was perfectly fine to do so, but um, it'd be a little bit tighter than the other cote that I normally use. Here's the same pair of cote, same victory cote now that I've been using for about a year, um, and these ones, exact same size, exact same uh, product, um, now these are much, much, uh, kind of they've got much more space inside because as I've used them obviously this is natural leather so as I've used them they've stretched a little bit and they've stretched to fit the actual um, shape of my hands so these are super super comfortable to, uh, for me now um, even though like I say the new ones the brand new ones I could go and use them now without much problem um, it's not like the old days like well, I say the old days, there's still places out there selling stuff like this, but like if you buy, you know, um, like when I bought my first burger, um, obviously not from Kendo Socks, it didn't exist. Um, <laughs> when I bought my first burger, like the cote were just like, you couldn't even move the thumbs like this, you couldn't even move them. Um, and uh, like gripping the shinai was like an absolute pain. Um, so, you know, even now, like with these, these brand new ones, I could go out and use them in Keiko today or tomorrow and it'd be no problem whatsoever um but like i said these are my these are my ones that i've been using for about a year now i've well worn them in uh, and they're exactly um the the fit that i want so my advice is not to have them um kind of roomy it's the same with the men the men's exactly the same it's better to have the men slightly tight at first because it will stretch to fit your actual face um even if it's even if it's a bit uncomfortable or painful, I usually when I get a new men, which I do more than most people, because <laughs> I'm always obviously testing the new products that we have. I actually usually take a, one size down um, from my actual sizes, uh, and it usually takes me about four or five practices to break it into how I want it to be. Um, I find this gets a better result for me because I, I then have a nice, nice fitting uchua um, that fits my exact face. Um, I often find that if I go for a size that's a little bit bigger, so I'm actually kind of between sizes must actually, I'm a bit, bit of an odd shaped head. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit small, um, especially for an adult male. <laughs> um, I was often kind of uh, teased about it in Japan. Um, but basically, um, so yeah, I take, I take quite a small size um, and then yeah it's a little bit tight on me at first but with with use it stretches out and it fits much better in the long run uh, and I always recommend to go down that route really if that makes sense uh, okay next one uh, this is a this is more of a comment than a question it's more of a comment than a question actually um, so I'm still drinking my coffee because I'm still getting over this sore throat that I've been <coughs> that I've had since the weekend um, okay it's more of a comment than a question that was on the last video and it's in response to the question that I answered in the last video kind of a, a little bit tongue in cheek really where it was how to win, in, the, the question literally was just how do I win, in, how to win in Kendall uh, and, and I jokingly said um, subscribe to the Kendall show and, and uh, buy your burger from Kendall Star um, which of course won't um, necessarily help you win uh, in Kendall but uh, it just might uh, so give it a try. Uh, <laughs> Um, but this is a comment that's in response to it and I'd like to kind of pick up on it because um, I kind of half agree and half disagree with it So I think it's a, a great uh, topic. Uh, it says to answer how to win in kendo brackets in my humble opinion It is actually just train uh, for years and years without pause several times a week, etc, etc um, Start when you're a child ideally um, Yeah, I, I half agree with that um, obviously, uh, practicing a lot is very, very important. It absolutely is. Um, and starting as early as you can, as early as you can, obviously does help. But there's more to it than that. Actually, there's a lot more to it than that. If it was just that, then everyone that started as a kid and then just trained every day until they were adults would be the best players in the world. But they're not. There's plenty of people uh, in Japan that start kendo as young, young kids. Um, and they, they, they carry on into adulthood and they never really achieve much in their kendo career because they're only, <coughs> they're, they, they might be going to training and they might even be trying quite hard when they're there, uh, but they're not putting the same effort in whilst they're there um, as some of their dojo mates who tend to excel above them. Uh, and it's not just while they're there, it's, it's all the time. Um, and... It, you know, even myself, I started Kendall much later than most Japanese people do. 
I was I was 19 years old when I started. Um, I wasn't able to train every day for hours on end. Um, I was only able to train once a week when I first started. Um, even when I moved out to Japan, I was an adult with a working, uh, you know, working life. I had a job, a full-time job, uh, and I had a um, I had a family at least for the first six years before I set up Kendo Star. Um, I, you know, I, I was I was in full time employment as well, so I wasn't able to train literally every day for uh, five five hours or whatever, um, or even three or four hours, um, like a lot of the other people that have been doing kendo uh, longer than me had done. Um, but still, I was able to progress past many people. Uh, it's not like I was the worst person there. Um, I was able to compete um, on reasonably even grounds with most people of a similar age. Um, to myself, actually, uh, because I kind of made up uh, for some of the lost time with what I'd put in outside of the dojo, um, as well as the way that I trained whilst I was there. Um, now, obviously, there was a, another class of people that are on a totally different level. Obviously, you've got the people that are uh, super elite or, or, or just super talented or other people that have put that effort in all the way along. Uh, and those guys are the guys that, uh, and girls that have really, really become... Um, super super strong um and there's plenty of people like that uh but then there was also plenty of people that yeah had started as kids they'd done kendo every day especially when they were at school um and they could sort of you know um gone gone through that sort of kendo route but they never they hadn't put the same into it as perhaps some of the other people had and and yeah they weren't they weren't suddenly you know super super brilliant um so uh yeah i mean part of it is that um Part of it is training uh, without without stopping, but also part of it is training smart. You've got to make sure that you, you're, you're making the most of your training uh, and also putting in the effort when you're not at the dojo, and that means uh, mitori geiko. Uh, and I've talked about this a lot. I talked about the, uh, what I call what I like to call the kendo blueprint, uh, which I'll probably talk about more in the future. Uh, okay, so moving on. Um, Next one. Uh, this is a, this is a cool question. Now these questions now are from the um, from the Kendo Show Early Access group, uh, which there's a link to in the description down below. Uh, make sure you're in that group. Obviously, it's free to join. It's a great place to post your questions because not only do I answer them in these videos, but you get loads of comments and stuff uh, from other Kenshi as well. Um, so this one says, um, and then the next question asks. I, after it actually links to it, I'll probably end up answering it for it. But uh, it says, "Hi, looking looking at the rule book uh, of Kendo, the English version, and sub subsi subsidiary rules for Kendo in Shia and Shinpan, uh, Article Thirteen. It specifies for the kote that the target is uh, the right forearm (brackets left forearm) if the opponent holds uh, Shinai with his left uh, or her left hand forward. Uh, does that mean that a left-handed?" Uh, a left-handed can hold the shinai with the left hand next to the tsuba. Okay, um, so I've got the book here. Uh, granted, this is the this is actually the previous publication, not the one that we uh, usually sell on Kendo Star, which is the updated publication, but it's out of stock at the moment. But it's coming in soon, so please be patient with that. Um, I've got it right here. Um, okay, uh, so it says Article Thirteen Datotsubui. Uh, prescribed in Article 14 of the regulations are shown in, I'm reading on this side by the way, the subsidiary rules, um, are shown in figure three, which is later in the book, actually. Um, figure three is there, so you get the, the picture here. Um, it says, uh, and the target areas of the men and kode are specifically provided as follows. The right and left side of the men shall be above the temple. Okay, so you've got basically this area um, for the for the men, and the target area of the kote uh, shall be the right forearm brackets the left forearm. If the opponent holds the shinai with his or her left hand forward, uh, in the case of chudan no kamae, uh, or the left and right forearms in the case of other kamae, um, and the. Uh, um, let me see if I can read the Japanese. I'm not so good at reading Japanese out loud like this, but uh, it says kote bu wa chudan no kamae no mo migi kote. Uh, and then in brackets, uh, it does say uh, hidari mai no hidari kote. Uh, oyobi chudan igai no kamae nado no toki no uh, hidari kote no uh, mata wa migi kote. So it's a, it, it, the, the translation is totally accurate. Um, it literally says the same. 
so there's no sort of misses in translation there. It does say that uh, hidari mai no hidari kote. So if you've got the left hand in front, then the left kote. So um, it says, uh, yeah, the answer to the question says if, if you want to hold the shinai with the left hand forward uh, and the right hand at the bottom, you're perfectly allowed to do that as far as the rules go. Um, whether it's a good idea or a benefit to you, well, that's a totally different thing. I don't think that it's a good... We've talked about this before. I think I've done loads of rants about this because it's quite... It comes up reasonably frequently, this kind of... Um, question or oh, if I'm left-handed can I hold the shinai the opposite way or can I put my feet the opposite way and it's like yeah you can but you know you don't need to um it's not going to make you better if you should just keep going on doing what you're taught to do by your sensei um and people look for shortcuts you see oh well I'm left-handed so it's harder for me well, it's not that it's hard for everybody uh so I, I don't recommend going down that route of having your left hand in front. But as far as the rules go, in answer to your exact question, yes, the rules uh, are referring to somebody who's got their la left hand forward in chudan no kamae. Okay? Um, it's just there to cover the eventuality where somebody would do that. Um, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying it never happens. Uh, but it is extremely rare. Now, there was a couple of comments in uh, on that thread that I wanted to pick up on as well. I'm not going to read them out and quote them and stuff, but uh, people talking about um, the second part of the sentence um, where it says uh, the left and right forearms in the case of other kamae. Uh, and there's a couple of co uh, uh, sorry comments talking about other kamae and talking about... Uh, Se a, a kamae called Segan and uh, Kasumi no kamae, Kasumi. Um, now, uh, and there's a sort of discussion going on in there saying that like most shimpan uh, just consider Segan and Kasumi as chudan um, or alternative chudan. Now, se Segan is uh, what most people call Segan when they're talking about kendo is when um, instead of holding the shinai, uh, if I can, in, in the middle like this, they hold it off to the side, maybe pointing at the um, uh, left eye of the opponent, or, or sometimes even the, the left kote if the person's in Jordan. Uh, and uh, Kasumi is like, I think it's originally like a Kenjutsu um, stance, and it looks kind of like this. You know, you've sort of seen it, it looks kind of Star Wars-y. Um, but in a kendo context, people often use it to describe when you do the kind of opposite of holding the shinai off center this way, and hold it across. <coughs> this way, um, which again is most often used against Jordan, left Jordan. Um, so here's the thing, right? Um, as far as the rules are concerned, and as far as the official teachings of the All Japan Kendo Federation, um, those kamai, those those kamai exist, but they don't exist as Segan and as uh, Kasumi no Kamai. Those 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 words to describe those kamai are like older words that are used either by um, kind of Kenjutsu or by. Uh, there's no real modern Kendo official. AJ, All Japan Kendo Federation or International Kendo Federation publications that I'm aware of or teachings that I'm aware of that use either the term Segan or Kasumi in terms of Kamae. Now, I could be wrong and if I am, do let me know. Hit me up with a link down there um, or, or tell me about it. But as far as I'm aware, I don't think that there's there's such an official teaching. That isn't to say that those, those stances or Kamae don't exist. They certainly do and they're certainly useful. But let's take kata number five for example, the kendo kata, um, Utsutachi goes to Jordan, left Jordan, and the um, uh, Shitachi will go to what we will be referring to in this case as the Seigan, uh, where they, it's kind of like Seigan, or sometimes I even heard it called Hira Seigan or something like that. But the official modern kendo, All Japan Kendo Federation term for that kamai is actually Jordan ni taishite chudan. Okay, so it's the ch chudan, uh, chudan versus Jordan um, is what is what it's called. Uh, and I think that it's also considered that for this kind of kamai as well. Um, so in my opinion, and the way I would judge a shi is, yeah, I would I would consider those as, as chudan or Jordan, Jordan ni tais de chudan. Um, uh, uh, Jordan ni tais de chudan, something like that, um, which is what, what they tend to be called um, when they're discussed in an actual, um, modern kendo context 
uh, if that makes sense. Uh, someone also mentioned Gedan, uh, which I guess according to the rules, yeah, I guess you could technically hit the left Kote if they're in Gedan. Um, but I think, you, I think you'd struggle doing it. I think you'd struggle pu actually pulling it off. Uh, so yeah, um, I think that's the, I think that sort of covers those comments as well. It's just my, uh, it's just my uh, uh, sort of thing. Um, some people also mentioned about ca this, this kind of old fashioned Kasumi because they, they kind of, this kind of Kenji style Kasumi um, being similar to kind of a, a blocking, blocking posture, which, which isn't really, we don't really do that one in Kendo. It's more like this one. I guess you would think maybe you could consider this one as Kasumi as well. I don't know if that's a... That's the stance. I don't know. I don't know anything about Kenjutsu. Um, but this kind of sam Sampo ma Mamori, Sampo Mamori is, is this kind of uh, three point block where you're trying to block your men, your kote, and your door at the same time. Um, is different. Okay? Um, and that's. Uh, that's not actually a kamai unless you're using it as a kamai, which is why they came up with a rule for um, junior high school students a few years ago saying that if they stood in a, uh, I think they called it henke shita kamae, with the left hand, and I think they said with the left hand above uh, the chest, when they were specifically referring to standing like this, because lots of, lots of youngsters was, were, were just fighting from this position and then striking like this from here, like this. And it said that if they if they use this as a kamae all the time, and then tried to hit from this position, uh, then not only would the strikes not be considered valid, but they'd also get warnings and given handsuck and stuff like that. That was for junior high school students, though. By the way, it's not a common rule in Japan for everyone. Uh, so yeah, that's I think I think I've kind of covered that. Um, and the next one, the next question as well is it's really related. It's kind of already been answered, but it says if your opponent is in Jordan, do both of their kote become valid targets as they are above shoulder height? Uh, I seem to recall something about it, but then again, I could be completely mistaken. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> like like it says, the final sentence there, it says um, uh, the left and right forearms in the case of other kamae. So Jordan is definitely included in that. So if they're in left Jordan or right Jordan, then both of their kote are fair game. Okay, um, so I think... That one is pretty straightforward. <laughs> uh, that's it for the questions today. I hope you enjoyed. Um, leave, me, leave me some more down below. Uh, let me know what you'd like me to rant about next time, uh, either in the comments down there, um, or you can um, obviously get into the Kendo Show Early Access group. The link's there as well. Um, so that's a great place because, again, you get a, a great load of dis discussion uh, come up from that too, um, from other Kenshi from all over the world. So that's a really great place to uh, to go and post your questions. Um, don't forget to go and do your shopping at kendostar.com because uh, that's the website that I run. Uh, it's really, really awesome stuff, uh, most importantly. Uh, I think I think our gear is the best you can get and I think the prices are really good. Um, but more importantly, I think it's, it, it, you know, it, it, it's such a super... Um, sort of response that we've had to it and I can I can really understand why uh, even though I do say so myself <laughs> yeah I know I know I would say that uh, but the gear is all designed uh, to fit the needs of the international community all the ball is super protective super comfortable uh, and super high quality so you don't have to keep changing it um, and stuff like that uh, we've got a great selection of Shinai on sale as well obviously it's the Christmas season and all that so we've got the holiday sale on right now I think that's running through to the 28th um, so that's next Friday so we've got just over a week on that. Uh, so uh, snap up those deals because some of those deals are gone forever once that's gone. Um, especially, for example, the Gaia Hakama. What a great Hakama that is. Amazing, amazing response we've had to that. Um, you get a free Blue Moon Ken Dogi with that. That that offer, it's been on now for about two or three months, um, is going out on the 28th. That will be gone. Um, so if you like the Blue Moon Ken Dogi and you want a good Hakama, uh, check out that Gaia Hakama because um, you get a free, free Blue Moon Ken Dogi. The deal on the Blue Moon Ken Dogi as well, I think we've got a, a decent discount going on on the Ken Dogi on its own. Uh, that will be gone as well. So uh, yeah, definitely go and check them out. That's enough, that's enough of the... Uh, the uh, the plug-in for that. Uh, don't forget, like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. You know what to do. And I'll see you all next time.